Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rubiul. I work as a lecturer in pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is Down syndrome part 2. This video will contain brief discussion about the diagnosis and management of Down syndrome. Okay, a lot of topics, so let's begin. So first we will talk about the diagnosis of Down syndrome. Now always remember Down syndrome can be diagnosed before birth or after birth. Before birth during pregnancy two types of tests can be done to look for Down syndrome. They are screening test and diagnostic test. Now what do we mean by screening test? Screening tests cannot identify if the baby definitely has Down syndrome or not. However, it can tell you how likely it is. So, screening tests can tell whether there is high risk or low risk of carrying a baby with Down syndrome during the pregnancy. Screening tests do not increase the risk of miscarriage. When screening tests show high risk of carrying a baby with Down syndrome, diagnostic tests are offered. Diagnostic tests can confirm whether the baby definitely has Down syndrome or not. However, they also carry small risk of miscarriage. So, what are the screening tests for Down syndrome? They will include first trimester combined test, quad screening test, etc. So, let's talk about these various screening tests one by one. Now, the screening test that is offered from 11 to 14 weeks of pregnancy is called the first trimester combined test. It is called a combined test because it includes a blood test and an ultrasound scan. Now, in the blood, we will measure the level of pregnancy-associated plasma protein A and human chorionic gonadotropin hormone level. Now, pregnancy-associated plasma protein A is a hormone that is produced by the placenta during pregnancy. Low level of this hormone can be associated with Down syndrome. Human chorionic gonadotropin is another hormone that is produced by the placenta in pregnancy. And pregnancies in which the fetus has Down syndrome tend to have higher level of human chorionic gonadotropin. Moving on to ultrasound scan. Ultrasound scan is used to measure fluid buildup at a specific area on the back of the developing baby's neck. This test is known as nuchal translucency test. Increased nuchal translucency is thought to be related to dilated lymphatic channels. And always remember, increased nuchal translucency is a non-specific sign of generalized fetal abnormality. For example, it can happen in Down syndrome, trisomy 18, or in heart problems. Now, it is not always possible to obtain a nuchal translucency measurement as it depends on the position of the baby. In such cases, different blood screening test is offered from 14 to 20 weeks. So, let's talk about the second screening test now. The screening test offered from 14 to 20 weeks of pregnancy is known as quadruple blood screening test. It looks for four specific substances. They are alpha fetoprotein, human chorionic gonadotropin, estriol, and inhibin A. So let's talk about these four specific substances one by one. So the first one is alpha fetoprotein. Now this is a protein that is produced by the fetus Initially, it is produced in the fetal yolk sac and liver. Small amount of this protein is also produced in the gastrointestinal tract of the fetus as well. Fetal alpha fetoprotein can diffuse across the placental barrier into maternal circulation. 
small amount of this protein is transported from the amniotic cavity as well. Now, low level of this protein may occur due to Down syndrome, Edwards syndrome, etc. Moving on to human chorionigonadotropin, we have already talked about this hormone. Increased level of total human chorionigonadotropin is associated with Down syndrome, while decreased level of this hormone may be seen in Edwards syndrome. Now always remember elevated level of this hormone may be also seen in multiple pregnancies in cases where the gestational age is overestimated. It can also be seen in fetal loss and also in high drops fetalis. So these were the other causes of elevated level of human chorionigonadotropin besides Down syndrome. Moving on to the third test, that is estriol, the third component of the quad screening test, that is estriol. It is an estrogen produced by both fetus and the placenta. Now, normally, estriol level increases during the course of pregnancy. Low level of estriol may be seen in Down syndrome and Edwards syndrome. It may be also associated with overestimation of gestational age and fetal loss. Inhibin A is a protein that is secreted by the ovary and it inhibits the production of the hormone follicle stimulating hormone that is uh, produced by the pituitary gland. The level of inhibin A is increased in the blood of mothers who are carrying fetuses with Down syndrome. Now always remember the values obtained from these screening tests along with maternal demographic information such as the age of the mother, her weight, gestational age, diabetic status, race, etc. are used together in a mathematical model to calculate the risk of Down syndrome. If the screening tests show high risk of Down syndrome, diagnostic tests are offered to confirm the diagnosis. However, the diagnostic tests do carry small risk of miscarriage. So, what are the diagnostic tests for Down syndrome? They will include amniocentesis, chorionic villus sampling, cardiocentesis, etc. Now, in amniocentesis, a sample of amniotic fluid surrounding the fetus is withdrawn with the help of a needle that is inserted into mother's uterus. For example, here I am showing you a very simple diagrammatic image denoting the procedure of amniocentesis. We can see that a needle has been inserted into mother's uterus. The needle has entered into the amniotic cavity and the procedure is done under ultrasound guidance and we can also see that the fetus is floating inside the amniotic cavity so this is the amniotic cavity this is the fetus this is the umbilical cord and this is the placenta so the sample that is obtained through amniocentesis is then used to analyze fetal chromosome. This test is usually done in the second trimester after 15 weeks of pregnancy. There is slight risk of miscarriage. However, if this test is done before 15 weeks of pregnancy, the risk of miscarriage will also increase. Moving on to chorionic villus sampling, the first thing that we have to know is what do we mean by chorionic villus. Now always remember, chorionic villi are tiny finger-like projections on the placenta. In chorionic villus sampling, cells are taken from these villi and sent for genetic analysis. This prenatal test is typically performed in the first trimester after 10 weeks of pregnancy and this test appears to carry somewhat higher risk of miscarriage than amniocentesis. 
Moving on to cardiosynthesis, this test is also known as percutaneous umbilical blood sampling or PUBS. In this test, fetal blood is taken from a vein in the umbilical cord and examined for chromosomal abnormalities. This test carries a greater risk of miscarriage than amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling. That's why this test is only offered when other tests did not provide the desired information. So these are the tests available to look for Down syndrome before birth. But always remember, none of these tests are mandatory and it is entirely the mother's decision whether or not to have these tests. Now, if the mother had decided to have these tests and if the results came positive for Down syndrome, the mother may be referred for genetic counseling so that she can make an informed decision according to her wishes and according to her beliefs and values and uh, so that she can properly decide what is good for her and her family. So these were the various ways we can screen and diagnose Down syndrome before birth. Now how can we diagnose Down syndrome after birth? Now always remember after birth the initial diagnosis of Down syndrome is often based on the baby's appearance but recall from the previous video of this series we had seen that the features that are associated with down syndrome can also be found in babies who doesn't have down syndrome so whenever the physician is suspecting a case of down syndrome the physician will likely order a test that is known as chromosomal karyotyping so a sample of blood from the baby will be taken and uh, the sample will be used to analyze the baby's chromosomes and if there is presence of an extra copy of chromosome 21 then the diagnosis will be confirmed for down syndrome so this is how we can diagnose down syndrome after birth so now that we have talked about the diagnosis of Down syndrome. Now we will move on and talk about the management of Down syndrome. Now, since Down syndrome is a genetic disorder, so unfortunately there is no cure for Down syndrome. However, there are a lot of ways by which we can reduce the burden on an individual with Down syndrome. For example, recall from the previous video, we had seen that many individuals with Down syndrome often have problems with congenital heart defect. That's why it is very important to diagnose such congenital heart defect as early as possible. Surgical correction of such congenital heart defect is appropriate if the condition was detected before one years of age because after this time pulmonary hypertension has been present for so long that uh, the surgery may not be successful that's why it is now recommended that an echocardiogram must be performed during the newborn period and it must be performed no later than six months Recall from the previous video, we had seen that individuals with Down syndrome often have eye problems. That's why they should be regularly examined by physician and if any problem is detected, they should be referred to an ophthalmologist who is familiar with Down syndrome. Again, hypothyroidism is a common problem with individuals of Down syndrome particularly during the adolescence. That's why thyroid hormone level should be monitored annually and if hypothyroidism is detected, it should be treated properly. Again, we had seen in the previous video that individuals with Down syndrome may develop sensory neural and conductive hearing loss. That's why routine follow-up should uh, be done so that uh, we can test 
the hearing of the baby properly. So routine follow-ups should include a hearing test at birth and then every six months until two years of age. And subsequent testing may also be advised as needed. Again, individuals with Down syndrome may have instability in their first and second vertebrae and that may result in spinal cord injury in older Down syndrome patients. That's why proper imaging studies should be done to exclude those instabilities, particularly if the individual is planning to participate in some sports or athletic activity. Again, there are referral services available so that infant and children with Down syndrome can be referred to preschool programs so that they can improve their developmental disabilities. So this was in short about the management of Down syndrome. So this concludes part two of this series. I hope this video was helpful. If you like my videos, do comment, share, subscribe and let me know. And for my students, I will also recommend you to go through your textbooks to know more information. Okay, that's all for today. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.